unveil the book. So this is the uh, the first uh, outing for the parents of Desire in Goa. Uh, Amrita and I are, are, are old friends from Madras, but now she's defected to Goa very wisely. Um, the metaphors of outing and unveiling and the <laughs> right of the erotica book are not lost. <laughs> So, I'm going to jump right in, but I just want to say one thing that um, while I was reading your book, I was thinking of this word that, um, that another writer and friend of ours, Jeet Thai, taught me, and the word is stickomancy. And uh, it's basically the idea of divination, that whatever you are looking for, you will find it when you need it. And books are great for that, I think, because sometimes you, especially with a book that's kind of non-linear and circular, and that you can go into wherever you want. So, you know, so for instance, you open the page, and um, the line I see is, these wretched husbands have made our lives a mess and misery. I wonder what that means. Um, <laughs> so, um, so this book is, is, is very much um, like that because it's a kind of companion book. And so I wanted to first ask you, why do you dedicate your book to the modern reader? Why do you have this direct address to the modern reader? Well, I think the modern reader is in need of companionship uh, on the erotic journey. And unlike yesterday, as it were, uh, we have no gods to help us. I think for many of us, books are the only gods we have or the, or the closest thing to it, um, so the friends perhaps. And so uh, my interest was in bringing together uh, the erotic worlds, but reading them as a kind of wisdom literature. Uh, which came to me as I was in the process of reading, um, it suddenly occurred to me that this is a, like a companion, something that could walk with you on the erotic journey. But if we looked at it in its original form, it doesn't really work. If um, we have to uh, organize it in a way that the modern reader could appreciate and get something out of it, so that was my, my idea, was to make them accessible and easy to find something that you're hungering for in the right moment. Yeah, and it does that beautifully. But um, to lead into this question of structure, you have uh, divided the book. And this is 3,000 years of you know, erotica, which is a huge project, first of all. I mean, you'll say something about that later, I hope. But I was very intrigued with the very contemporary taglines you had structured the book under nostalgia, the first time, abandonment, anger, breakups, um, men who wish to be women. Really, uh, I think things that speak to us very directly. Um, so where did you get the idea to, to have, again, this sort of very contemporary focus but using both ancient and modern texts and putting them together in the way that you have? I think it really emerged in the process of reading. Um, I started to see that over time there were certain themes uh, that people kept writing about and that seemed to be very important to anyone writing on the erotic. And so I had these piles of books and papers all over my study and I started collecting them together in ways I started chronologically. So the way you go about a project like this is to start chronologically and research the major erotic works. So I started chronologically, but then I, as I noticed that people separated by hundreds of years are writing about the same themes, I started separating it thematically instead. And can you talk about some of the surprises or some of the, the pairings, perhaps, between the ancient and modern that you were most pleased with? Yes, the, that's right up to my heart. Because when I was finished, I thought it's really a special to have these pieces that are separated by so long a time in conversation with each other. So you can read Peramal Murugan 
and his exploration of jealousy and suspicion. And you can read it alongside another short poem from the Amaru Sadaka, where they also explore feelings about jealousy and suspicion. And there's something about um, being able to dive in in that way to particular uh, moods, or rasas, if you will, that really spoke to me. So maybe I could read a yeah, little please. bit. Also, can we have AC on? It's like I've been, boiling. I've been telling it's hot on here. I know the theme is erotica, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not the sweaty kind. I okay. So I started the the first section of the book is called uh, Why Bother with Sex because I didn't want it to be self-evident that it's important to explore sexuality. And in this, I, I pair together several different things, but the two things that really jump out to me that I'm going to read from very briefly is uh, a short piece that's a recreation from the Rig Veda, and it's called Why Does Sex Exist? And I paired alongside, um, almost 1600 years later, uh, The Garden of Kama, which is a uh, poem by an Anglo-Indian poet. So, from the Rig Veda, the question of why does sex exist? In the beginning, we didn't even know what it was. Born of the mind, Brahma, accustomed to the multiplication of fleeing images, we were, we were bewildered when Brahma announced that it would be a task to initiate a new mode of creation. A few thousand years went by, we had become masters of pleasure. One day when he called us all together, we asked Brahma, what is all this pleasure for? And Brahma smiles, a somewhat embarrassed smile, and he says, to preserve the world's gloss. And that passage concludes, every time we see to pleasure, we help the world preserve its gloss. To cut to Lawrence Hope, she writes, we know not life's reason, the length of its season. Know not if they know the great ones above. We none of us sought it, and few could support it, were it not guilt with the glamour of love. So there's this idea in both these texts that the erotic, love, sexuality makes our lives less boring and less dusty. And even though in the Rig Veda they say, Tapas is so important, we must retreat into ourselves, the world is all Maya. Brahma Vashishta says, the most authoritative among us says, the world is like a cloak we must put on, otherwise it would grow dusty. But if Tapas always drew us back to the formless place from whence we came, the world would wither too soon. So the whole concept of drawing out pleasure and uh, its importance as a way to make life more interesting and more glossy. It's lovely, and um, you know, I can't help thinking we live in such divided times on, on every level. It feels it's so extreme. Um, and you, in your introduction, talk about the literary romantics versus the religious traditionists versus the, the erotically um, what, positive versus the erotically anxious. And I think um, it's very interesting to to go into that introduction of yours where you're kind of painting um, a scene for us and telling us that it was not that everything in the past that everybody understood erotica and that it was all great and it was the time of Kama Sutra, what, you know, whatever but that it has always been divided in this sense and so you are falling alongside um, and, and sort of championing those who, who would want to keep the erotic in the center. Can you talk about that? Yes. And also an extension with the fact that you've written a, your own collection of short stories before this, erotic short stories, and how going from the personal into this sort of wider angle of an anthology which is encompassing these 3,000 years, that, that kind of personal to a larger perspective mm -hmm. of erotica. Mm -hmm. So when I wrote my book of erotic short stories, it was 2013 it was published, but I had already um, turned it into the publishers in 2012. And something had definitely changed, as we all know, at the end of 2012, where the climate to talk about these things uh, really shifted. So at that time, my idea in writing that book was 
to be, as a woman writer, writing a book of erotic short stories and sending it out into the world, to do something that had not been much done. But when I started writing um, and researching The Parents of Desire, I realized it's actually been done a hundred times. It's just that um, these writers haven't had a lot of help in sh showcasing their efforts, as it were, and, and they haven't existed as a cohort. We don't think of having, uh, you know, we talk about the Kama Sutra, of course, but we don't have a sense that we have a community of erotic writers. We have a body of erotic works um, across time that our modern contemporary writers are just drawing back into something rather than inventing something new. So this uh, idea really impassioned me. And I also, I think like many people uh, who grew up in India before uh, 2012, felt angry that the other side, the other position, has gotten so much more help in being narrativized and this idea that India is a conservative culture and that uh, we don't talk much about sexuality. It really involves not reading and ignoring a huge body of literature. So if someone says to me, um, what is India like? Uh, it, what is erotic like in India? I would say it depends on what you're reading. And I wanted to put together some reading that could really be, uh, you know, a Kamadeva incarnate in the sense of making available to people uh, this heritage that in many of the major Indian languages we have these extraordinary texts that uh, embrace the erotic. Uh, because the, the Purushartas, the um, Kama, Tha, Moksha, they have caused us to come into relationship with Kama. Uh, I missed that one, which is a bit funny. Uh, they've caused us to come into relationship with Kama in a way that makes us worried that Kama will destabilize us. And the Indian notion of family also uh, keeps us a little bit on our toes about Kama. And it, I'm sort of, sort of been, felt very sad to see that uh, in these extraordinary uh, texts that we did not have them available to us uh, as a body of work. So uh, that kind of passion about that really inspired me. Yeah. And I want to ask about the Kama Sutra because it is um, it's a kind of code word for uh, erotica in a way. I think internationally, if you were playing that game taboo, you know, if you got erotica, then Kama Sutra would be the word that you cannot say because it's a sort of... Um, People think they know what it is, but I think very few people have actually read it. And uh, I want you to, to tell us about actually the Kama Sutra and what uh, is your sort of, um, what did you take away from the Kama Sutra? Yeah, you aside, saw aside from the fact that all the positions, which is what, you know, the, the labels yeah. and things of. Yeah. Um, I think the Kama Sutra is a really good instruction manual at various levels uh, in how to live. And it's also not a very interesting read, and certainly not a very erotic read. It's, there's nothing really delicious about it. It's useful. If you have a problem, your Kama Sutra will solve it. Any idea you have in the erotic realm that you're not very sure about how to resolve, how to, how to prepare your room before lovemaking, what to serve afterwards, what kinds of trees are conducive to the art of love, these are things that the Kama Sutra is very helpful to, to tell us about. But if you want to feel uh, or have some companionship in your feelings, I don't think the Kama Sutra is as helpful. Uh, I was going to say that what I do like about it uh, is that it, the variety it encompasses in, in the, uh, the types of things it talks about that it relates to the erotic. It leaves almost no area uneroticized. It has a wide angle lens in which it looks at the erotic. And what I find most beautiful and what I really love about the Kama Sutra is the way it brings in nature into uh, our erotic uh, aspirations as well as our um, the, the backdrop to our erotic life. But do you have a sense of why the Kama Sutra from all of the many texts that we have in India particularly, 
which might be considered far more um, erotic or uh, definitely sort of bhakti poetry, for instance, you know, something that is very, very sensual in nature. Why this has taken predominance? Is there a sense of why that happened? Do you know? I don't know. But I think that um, certainly, as you said earlier, the whole idea of sexual positions is uh, something that flashes up sex really loudly. Um, I also think the fact that the Kama Sutra is so useful and is such an instruction manual and breaks things down so concretely um, is another reason why it's popular. But my guess will also be that if you look at the other major bodies of erotic works, the ones I liked best are the Amarasataka, which is in Kashmiri Sanskrit, the Tamil Sangam poems, and the Gata Sattasai, which is in Maharashtrian Prakrit. If you look at these erotic works, they uh, seem to go into the psyche and unravel uh, the darkness and despair also of uh, the erotic life, saying at the same time that it's worthwhile to engage in it. And the Kama Sutra does not have any poetry to it in that sense. Uh, so I think poetry is harder, as you know, and uh, people don't take to poetry as much. So I think the Kama Sutra is uh, an easier read. Yeah, easier to, yeah. <laughs> you brought up nature, which I think um, is a beautiful, I mean, you mentioned it again in your essay, which is so wonderful, and you, you, you say that medieval lesson, stay close to, stay erotic, stay close to nature. Um, and I think anybody who has even a sort of brief knowledge of uh, poetry and, and literature and painting and music in this country will know that nature is very much the companion of uh, sexuality in a sense. Uh, and you also mentioned that we are now somewhat struggling with our relationship to nature in these times because we are very urbanized, we are living away, um, uh, and, and we have a sort of, there's been a distancing of body from land. So could you talk a little bit about that relationship um, between body and nature and sexuality and how you see that as being problematic maybe in today, today's world? I think I'd like to read a poem uh, as a way of buying time as well as uh, to sort of stimulate your thinking about this. So this poem is called Then and Now and it's written in Sanskrit around the 9th century by Silla Batrika. I lost my virginity to the man who is now my husband. These are the same moonlit nights. This is the same breeze that floats down from the Vindhya mountains, laden with the scent of flowering jasmines. I too am the same woman. Yet, how I long with all my heart for the riverside, overgrown with rushes that once knew our wild, joyous lovemaking. And, and what, I, what I got from this, I mean, of course, reading it today, she's just reflecting back on her time with the, river, with the river and her husband. But to us, reading back here, and I read again, how I long with all my heart for the riverside, overgrown with rushes that once knew our wild, joyous lovemaking. My association to that is our early experiences of desire, uh, and childhood uh, pleasure in the world around us, I think, uh, which we feel in our bodies, is so linked with nature. And there's a deep sadness now in knowing that we are so distanced from that. And uh, living lives in which our bodies and nature are sort of in two separate compartments, as it were. I think the absence of nature in our lives, for those of us who, who have uh, not you, surely, but uh, for those of us who have an absence of nature in our lives, leads to a, a sort of insularity of our desire. Uh, we sort of seeking within ourselves and not drawn out as much in the same way. And I also think we get a bit disconnected with our bodies, which is, I guess, something that we're speaking about a lot these days. But um, being away from nature and the disconnection from our bodies, uh, I think it's to a particular kind of uh, eros, one that is um, 
helps us avoid seeing uh, what we have done, that helps us avoid uh, that longing for the riverside because in so many places those riversides don't exist anymore. So I think it's become an imperative of sorts to get away from nature uh, when it's so ripped apart and ravaged as it were. And in the big cities, I think we answer that call by shutting ourselves more and more into rarefied atmospheres and five-star hotels. But something is lost in the process. And I'm not sure if I put words to it as much as the poet did, but I, I do feel that some, in some way we lose it. Yeah. This whole, um, these binaries, these compartments, I think I was thinking about that as well when I was reading the book. Because again, there's this um, wonderful area of uh, the erotic, which is um, Tantra and Bhakti poetry, which is bringing together uh, sexuality and spirituality. You identify this as an Indian, as particularly Indian theme. Um, and I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about that, because I think it's quite unique. I think nowadays when we look at the, the world of spirituality, it's, uh, it's on the opposite uh, spectrum, say, from the word, world of, say, sexuality. And yet, um, there are, and hopefully you can read some, this sort of beautiful celebration of that togetherness within the body. Yes. Yes, there, with the, the Bhakti writers especially, I think um, many of them are celibate. Um, many of them uh, are so clear that they are in relationships with other bodies, but their body is very much involved. And if you read these works, the the body of the poet, the aroused body of the poet, uh, in a transcendent sexual experience with a physically absent, uh, spiritually connected figure really, really stands out. Um, I'll read a poem or two. Having sexual relationships with other bodies. But their body is very much involved. And if you read these works, the, the body of the poet, the aroused body of the poet, uh, in a transcendent sexual experience with a physically absent, uh, spiritually connected figure, really, really stands out. Um, I'll read a poem or two. This is by Mirabai. Sister, the dark one, won't speak to me. Why does this useless body keep breathing? Another night has gone and no one's lifted my gown. He won't speak to me. Years pass, not a gesture. They told me he'd come when the rain clouds, but lightning pierces the clouds. I feel the old dread. Mira's whole life is a long night of craving. But, um, but what I wanted to go with that, go with that is that you know Mira in that case is not uh, actually having sex, but yet her longings take the form uh, of eros and they take the form of a physical eros in which she longs for the Lord. She says to lift her gown. And um, I, people ask me all the time, what do you think is the point uh, of these writers uh, talking about their bodies if they're not really? Uh, engaging with their bodies and my response to that is I think that they are very much engaging with their bodies and may not be another body there present. But as far as what we can get out of it, I think it, 
is a sort of transcendence, as it were, the possibility of going beyond yourself that the Bhakti poets touch into, um, that is discoverable in a sexual experience. And the reason why I think it's wonderful to include them and read them as if they were having sexual experiences, because I, I guess I think that they are. They just don't involve a, a second body with them. But the physical arousal that you see in a Mahadevi Akka and an Andal or in a Mirabai or, or all of there in this book uh, is quite visceral and elevated. I mean, I think all this sort of also brings and begs the question of uh, trying to differentiate between the area of erotica and the area of pornography. Because I think now we are living in an age where, um, you know, things are very accessible, titillation, excitement, the internet has changed the whole quality of desire. And I wonder, um, you know, can we, can we, can we try to separate and understand um, what is different between these areas of pornography and erotica, and 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 why are we championing for the erotic? Why is it important? Well, as a literary style, I think erotica is way more aspirational than pornography, and um, there are so many ways to go about distinguishing the two, but. Uh, some of the things that speak to me uh, is, a, is the pace. Uh, I feel like pornography has a, a much more goal-directed and rapid pace relative to erotica. The range of the lens, I think erotica has a wide-ranging lens uh, that throws the cast of the erotic, the gloss, as it were, uh, over all the things that surround the person or people who are having the erotic longing. Whereas Pornography is, well, I don't think you could even call it a cast, but a trajectory as it were. It's much more goal direct. Pornography is uh, trying to elicit a very particular reaction um, rather than uh, allowing the reader uh, to go into a range of possible sensual experiences. Pornography is a drive directed and goal directed towards orgasm. So in the piece, in the narrative style, and in the element of longing. I think pornography is about satisfying your longing as soon as possible. And if you, if you look at what people do to um, do an internet search looking for pornography, uh, they already know what they want. Two women, big-breasted. They're doing, uh, trying to fulfill a desire almost as if to get rid of it, having watched the pornography clip. Whereas I believe the erotica is so much more about drawing things out. In almost uh, any erotic work, and I think this probably is what distinguishes the two, um, there's an element of longing. There's a person wants another person, not only because of how they look on the outside or some kind of plot line that's going to get enacted, but because something about their insides is appealing. There's a, a, a holism, as it were, to it. I, I think that's fascinating, the whole quality of desire. We talked about this in, a, in an interview that we did, and I was just saying, I'd seen this comedian who was talking about the first, when he was 14, he found out his first picture of a naked girl, you know? And it was such a big deal because the idea of the naked girl was so um, impossible. And, and now, of course, you want to see a picture of a naked girl, it's, it's very easy, or a naked boy for that matter. Um, and so this, this thing of desire and, and what happens um, when the quality of desire changes, um, there's a shrinking of desire. Um, yeah, I want you to speak about that because I have another marriage related question also to do with desire. <laughs> um, the shrinking of desire, it, it's, I think it also links back to your previous question about nature. I think that what is very erotic and sexy is truth. And uh, when lovers first come together, they are able to speak the truth. And as long as they are able to continue doing that, um, there's something very powerful that moves them. But there's a certain sh short-circuiting um, that makes speaking the truth very hard. And the distance from nature and our guilt about what's happening in the environment also makes uh, speaking the truth uh, very difficult. Where was I going with this? Um, what was your question? <laughs> no, then my question follow-up to that, to, to, to 
to the quality of desire because in your book you have uh, you make I mean there's a lot of pokes and digs at, at marriage and the state of marriage difficulty boredom stagnation to do with the erotic so I wonder if you talk a little bit about um, why so many digs at the married people <laughs> I think I think the poets it's mostly the poets. Uh, the artist, the artist dig at marriage is not really at marriage, but at boredom, at lack of spontaneity. The limp phallus is a symbol for something, uh, the juice gone out of things, and I think that's um, that's the part that I wanted to uh, to showcase because I think it's very real. I think uh, you know, in good marriage goes in and out of that at times, but um, I think there's there's a certain um, ethos to it that really appealed to me. And um, I thought that some of the pieces, like uh, there's this piece from the Amaru Sadhaka that says, um, How our bodies were one before, then they grew apart. You the lover, and I wretched one, the loved. Now you're the husband, and I'm the wife. What else could have made a stone of the heart but this, a bitter fruit to swallow? And <laughs> There's another translation of this that goes, now you're the husband and I'm the wife, how do I deal with this damn and hard life? And I felt this just something really hard hitting and poignant that, about that, that really spoke to me. But even these um, ideas of husband and wife, these are positions. And I, I think what the, why I showcase this is not to mock married people, but rather to to say that any of us could get into this position where we're holding solid roles that are inflexible that don't allow us to move, and to me, that's what the um, the marriage that should be poked fun at is. It's the marriage that has become very solidified, and that uh, which could be any kind of relationship, really, uh, where the roles are calcified in some way that doesn't allow playfulness, spontaneity, you know. And so, what what do you think? Um, what would you say um, aside from our disconnect from nature and all of that? What do you think are our greatest threats to our erotic imagination, our erotic life now? The two boredom. The threat to boredom. Boredom is a threat to erotic life. Yes. <laughs> well, yes and no, right? Because I think you have to actually get into the boredom and realize that you're really bored to start thinking about what to do next. And these days we don't allow ourselves to get bored at all because the internet has spared us this horrible position of being bored. We never have to ever be bored. And we also never have to wait. And so I think the position of longing uh, is not easily accessible these days. We are satisfied too quickly. We're always satisfied. I mean, it sounds good, but it's actually a problem. We're always quickly satisfied. And it's, uh, I like to say that it's like we're eating these quick bites or grazing all the time. And so I think that uh, our erotic satisfaction uh, gets a bit blunted by it. It's not necessary for us to be consuming uh, erotic quick bites, but just the constant consumption of things leaves us in this state of um, uncertain satiety, I would say, that when we're never really uh, left wanting, and I think it's wanting that uh, leads us to a very truthful er erotic journey. That's very well said. I'm going to open it up soon. I just have one last question uh, before we take some questions from the audience. Um, there was a very interesting line in the introduction about how uh, in India there is this thing that is the opposite of Freud, what Freud called penis envy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a bit fast. I mean, I've always been interested. I think in India we have always sort of never been stuck in binaries. So we have great fluidity. Uh, in terms of gender, and we have myths and stories to to remind us also of this possibility. But um, could you talk a little bit about what uh, where that came from, and how that also feeds into the subject, I suppose? Yeah, uh, it's a nice link back to the first sentence that you read. Perhaps there was intentional knowing you. <laughs> so, uh, what is Shine referring to, which I talk about in the book? Uh, a correspondence that went on between Freud and Girinda Sekhar Bose, who was the first Indian psychoanalyst. So Bose reads Freud's works, he's very impressed, he starts practicing, he's already a psychiatrist, he starts practicing, seeing um, patients for psychoanalysis, and he writes Freud's letter saying, 
to paraphrase. But this whole thing about penis envy, I don't really think you've got the right idea. I think penis envy is just a reaction. Um, but what is underneath that is boys longing to be girls and men's envy of women. And Freud, of course, is appalled at today. Please read everything over again one more time, because I'm sure you'll understand that. Um, that primary femininity does not exist. Um, Bose uh, wrote back very politely, you know, it was colonial times, and he said, okay, maybe it's only Indian men who have this wish to be a woman, but I can tell you that my experience with Indian patients and Caucasian parent patients leads me to think that the Indian man uh, longs to have the experience of being a woman. And this is actually much further corroborated in clinical studies and so forth. And the idea that is quite accepted in Indian psychoanalysis is that particularly as the life cycle goes on, Indian men uh, find more and more their wish, realizing their wish to be women. And it gets manifested, for example, as a maternal feminine attitude in men. But the, um, what I really loved about the erotic poetry, uh, in, including much of the poetry written by men, is that this longing to be a woman is so clear. And so in the piece that uh, Tishani started reading, These Wretched Husbands Have Made Our Lives a Mess and a Misery, it's written by a poet, Jurat, uh, around the 18th century, a uh, male poet, and he says, how delightful it is when two vulvas meet. This is a tale they tell each other all the time, the way that you love me. There's no love lost between women and men these days. New ways of being intimate are seen all around. Everyone knows about women who love women. At night, these words are always to be heard. The way that you rub me, ah, it drives my heart wild. Stroke me a little more, my sweet Dogana. I'd sacrifice all the men for your sake, he says. And so you wonder what this poet, who, whose sexuality is not known to us, gets out of imagining uh, women together, imagining the ruin of marriages, and uh, uh, women sort of arriving together out of the, the bounds of heterosexual marriage. And there's another piece in here that Arshia Sankar was kind enough to translate for me. Um, it's called, Who Has a Better Experience, Man or Woman? And it's a conversation between Yudhishthira and Bhishma, you know, that's what you do, I guess, after the, the war is over for the day, you sit around and you talk about sex. And uh, Yudhishthira asks Bhishma, well, spit it out, this is something I've been wondering for a long time, who has a better sex? Uh, and Bhishma tells a long story involving a uh, king, Bangasvana, who gets turned from a man into a woman. And uh, to cut a long story short, at the end of the story, he has a chance to be turned back. Um, no, sorry, he has a chance uh, for his children, who, whom he had as a woman, or his children whom he had as a man, to be uh, brought to life. And he says, I choose the children I had as a woman. And so the god asks him, and asks him why. And he said, you know, the feeling you have as a mother and that tenderness, it's far superior to what you can have as a man. And then Indra says, well, what about you? Would you like to be turned back into a man? And he says, no, because the sexual experience that I've had as a woman far exceeds anything I've had as a man. So, it is written. <laughs> it's written. Okay, we have ten Put up our shields and say, look, I need to think about what I want. And it's maybe not a beer right now. Uh, I think we're still evolving those kinds of defenses uh, to consumer culture and the internet because we're still in a stage where we're jumping into it and trying to get as much of it as we can at the same time. I want to add that, uh, that along with that, uh, the, the whole psychiatry movement and the, the, the medication movement uh, together with this, I think we're narrowing our bandwidth in a way uh, of, of what we can stand. Because I think it's helpful to think about pleasure also as something that we uh, have a tolerance for, and if, if we can, you're used to having just certain kinds of pleasures and going into an unknown one. I don't want to look it up. Um, it's it's in the section on um, suspicion and jealousy, and um, this is how it goes. When we make love in the traditional position, he finds it so boring. But try something new, and he demands to know where I learned it. <laughs> <laughs> That's
great. So the bad news is that Amrita's books are not at the books bookstore, which is really, really sad. However, the internet is good for some things. So you may buy it on, on, on uh, the internet and um, please read it. It's a beautiful, beautiful book.